the Buzz podcast, helping smart businesses be even more innovative. Hi, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Welcome to episode number 89 of the InnovaBuzz podcast, designed to help smart businesses committed to innovation, service and modern marketing become even more innovative. In this episode, I welcome to the podcast as my guest, Phil Singleton, co-author of SEO for Growth. He's also a duct tape marketing consultant and owner of his own web design agency, Kansas City Web Design and SEO. We discuss SEO in great detail and the concept of making your website the hub of your online presence to build your authority and to be a revenue generating asset. This episode is full of great marketing advice for any business. Without further ado then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Phil Singleton. Hi, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz and I'm really excited to have with me today on this episode of the InnovaBuzz podcast all the way from Kansas City in the USA, Phil Singleton from SEO for Growth. Now, Phil is co-author of several Amazon best-selling books, including the book named SEO for Growth. He's an active blogger. He's a duct tape marketing certified consultant and he runs his own web design agency. So welcome to the podcast, Phil. Hey, thank you so much. Yeah, it's a great privilege to have you here. Now, oh, me too. Kim Doyle suggested we get you on the podcast. So big hello to Kim. Thanks for hey, Kim. the introduction. Great, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to our chat today because I know from reading through the book, SEO for Growth, that uh, you're, you've actually changed my whole thinking about SEO because I had this vision that SEO was all about putting keywords in the right places and this whole industry that has evolved around um, trying to manipulate the Google search engine to get a high ranking and I, you know, people would ask me, do you do SEO? And I say, well, I don't really do that stuff because I don't believe in it. But then your book really says that SEO is the whole strategy. It's the bigger picture, the whole strategy around how you get traffic to your site and all the things you do. So I've, I've kind of, you know, it just blew my mind. I thought, well, actually, I do do SEO. I just do it in a different way than those people that kind of give the industry a bad name. So I really appreciate that summary because that is so genuine. It's like, yeah, I mean, that's exactly um, in a nutshell kind of what it's, what it's come to. And I've got a couple of opinions on how it, you know, what it's all about and how it gets there. But yeah, that's, that's really it. It's, it's, you know, it's doing things holistically uh, and aiming and looking at them the way Google's looking at them now yeah, um, yeah that's versus right. just tweaking stuff under the hood. Right. Mm. Yeah. Well, I'm really keen to, explore that a bit more. But before we do that, um, and before we talk about SEO and inbound marketing and entrepreneurship and innovation and those kind of things, let's find out a little bit more about your background because I know you've had a really interesting story. So when you were a young kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? Uh, boy, that's a really good question. I've heard you ask this a couple different times. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't think that I ever really had like a picture of, you know, I wanted to be this or this profession or kind of one of these hero jobs, which I probably should have, you know, when I was real, I guess, growing up, I had an intense interest in um, really animals, you know, birds, reptiles, that kind of stuff. I had lizards and snakes growing up and that kind of thing. And I was always outside trying to catch things, you know, out in the, yeah. out in the yard. Of, um, so when, I guess maybe at that real early on, I, I thought maybe some kind of a career that took me into the, you know, animal world. Um, I guess I, if I thought about anything, it would have been that. But really, I think when I kind of got old enough to think about, you know, what I wanted to do, I think the real kind of early on maybe career change, because some days you grow up and it's like, is this, am I here or, you know, <laughs> I'm in my 40s, do I still know what I want to be when I grow up? I think I kind of <laughs> do and I'm there right now, yeah. but, and, you know, you're just kind of thinking about great opportunities that are in front of you and what other things you can do to kind of extend your story out. But for me, I think one of the really big things was going through college, not knowing what I wanted to do and just hoping for a job to get out and start earning, you know, and being on my own two feet right out of school. And what ended up happening is that, that happened. I got a job. I got a job at, a, at an insurance company mm. um, because it was there and they interviewed me and the, and the salary and the training was, or it looked really good. But and what ended up happening and is, is that I stayed there for three years, you know, by the third year I was kind of looking around and I'm like going to, to work in a beige building, you know, with, <laughs> with beige carpet and beige cubicles. Yeah. 
have a beige pants on. Um, <laughs> and I'm looking around. I actually still have this vision in my mind, like looking around, having this realization where there's guys that have been in this insurance company for 20, 30, 30 yeah, plus years. Right. And I was like, this is just not me. I, and I, every day that I went, the first year, second year, third year, you know, the days got longer <laughs> um, and watching the clock. And, and it was just felt like I was kind of, my soul was slowly and slowly being crushed. Yeah, well, when um, you start, and, oh, no, I've, I've realized that when you start watching the clock in those situations, that's, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> Well, the bigger, exactly. The bigger realization, I think, to me, and I had this early on, I don't know if that was because I just had a moment of maturity or what, but I felt I got to a point in my life in my early 20s where I had this job where it was kind of like um, the salary and stuff was good, and it, it, it just felt like all of a sudden I could see my life being pulled down a direction that I was never really going to get out of because each year that went by, I made a little bit more money, got a little more comfortable. Mm. And I was like, geez, unless I make some kind of a change and figure something out here, then I'm just going to be stuck down somebody else's path or destiny. Right. Yeah. Um, so I did something really wild that at that, that time that my parents, I think thought like truly probably lost a screw. I, I just basically picked out my bags, quit my job and moved over to Asia because mm. I figured, Hey, you know what? A lot of different reasons. My dad company was doing business out there. I always kind of had a little bit of an interest in, in Asia from, from just things that I'd read about. And always kind of interested to me. And I, and I figured, hey, you know what? I'm going to move out there, do something adventurous, learn learn Chinese and spend some time out there. And that's the one point, I think, where it really kind of changed the trajectory of my life and my career path and, and ended up, you know, basically putting me on the path where I am today. Um, and that was kind of, you know, through a bunch of different things, opportunities came in front of me, you know, kind of marching down this, this digital path into um, SEO and web design, all that kind of stuff. Hmm. So did you have a, uh, a port of call there in Asia or you mentioned your dad was doing business out there? Yeah, he um, worked for a theater chain called AMC Theaters. It's here in the States um, and they were growing internationally at that time. So he'd always come back and I could see kind of the, the, the light in his eyes about, yeah, about yeah. you know, Asia, the, the, the speed of everything, how things happen, the work ethic, all the things that were going on. And actually, I actually had a friend of mine who had a twin brother um, in college that was doing a, a semester abroad in Japan, which I don't think too many people were doing as much as they are now um, back then. And that just always kind of interested me. So what ended up happening is I, I packed my bags. I went up there. I studied Chinese for, for two or three years. And I went back and got to the States and got my MBA. Um, that was in the school called Thunderbird in Phoenix that does a lot of international management, that kind of stuff. As soon as I graduated and got my MBA, I ended up getting a job that took me back to Taiwan. Okay. So yeah. that's how I went. So I was two, three years there, and then I took another seven years after grad school, seven or eight years um, working there. And that, I, that time was right around the kind of the dot-com era. So mm -hmm. I'm this you know, guy in, in Taiwan that could speak, um, you know, was basically functionally fluent in Chinese, um, helping these North American startup companies in the dot-com era raise venture capital from strategic agent investors and that kind of stuff. So that was really exciting, a lot yeah. more exciting than, than um, selling you know, or, or trying to work in the insurance industry early on. So I really felt that time was cool. Of course, the dot-com thing bust. That's right. Yeah. Um, and I had to find some other ways to add value kind of as a Westerner in a, you know, in a place that's basically 99%. Um, Chinese or Asian, that kind of stuff. So that was exciting and challenges. But what ended up happening is a software company out of the U.S. ended up basically kind of falling into my lap. Um, they had had some issues with um, with the company and the technology in the states, and for for all sorts of various reasons, they wanted to move to Asia. I had happened to have been doing some some work for these guys, and they said, "Hey, we're going to set up shop in Taiwan." So basically, in a very short period of time, I ended up being able to kind of um, start get investment funding and have a software company that had about 25 employees. So again, got to build something from scratch on somebody else's dime in another country. Um, but it really was at that point, kind of in the early 2000s, that I started to see this, um, the digital stuff. And it started to really make sense to me because we were selling it. At that time, we were selling a consumer software product and we were selling it around the world. Most of it was coming online. A lot of it was retail stores. But what was happening, and this is early 2000s, most of our sales were coming from these, you know, affiliate relationships from people that had forums and kind of the precursors, the blogs, that kind of stuff. But yeah, yeah. In, in a nutshell, they had the, the traffic and the audience and the community. So we'd be working with these guys through the affiliate banners. They'd click through to our site, buy the software, 
And a lot of these guys, the big ones on a $99 piece of software, they were buying, you know, they were getting 50% of the commission. And if you had a lot of traffic, you know, we were cutting checks out through this software company for fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars a month. And I was like, holy cow, mm. these guys are probably not working all that much. And here I have a company with 25 employees, investors, product support. Our piece of that 50% was almost basically got, you know, eaten down to zero. Mm. <laughs> and it was even then where a lot of these people were searching for software and stuff was through Google. So I was like, dang, that's really where all the action is. You know, as people search for these solutions, they find these communities or whatever, or what have you, the content and you know, educate themselves and then, and then purchase, you know, once they find a solution. And so that thing we ended up selling kind of in the mid two thousands and I moved back to the States. It was a nice payday for me, but it wasn't like it wasn't like a quit my job and buy an island type of a thing, um, but it was nice financially, but it was also yeah. just that really kind of set me on the path here because I was at that point, I was like, man, Google's kind of where all the action is. Hmm. And and I started doing a couple websites um, basically on trade. The first, we can't, my wife and I moved back here, bought a house in Kansas City, and I was kind of trying to figure out what I wanted to do for a few months. And I, I ended up doing one website. And, I, and you got to look, the one thing I, I didn't really set, um, in the beginning of this is I am a true industry outsider in terms of web design and, and internet marketing, this kind of stuff. Mm. Finance geek, knew none of it, Don't not traditionally trained in graphic design or any kind of internet marketing or coding or anything. So uh, when I moved back from Kansas City after this kind of software adventure that I was in Asia, um, I literally... I literally um, went out and did a barter deal with for this um, auto detailer because I ended up buying a car and I said, hey dude, you should you should stop selling auto detailing services for $25 to these you know, car dealers that were, weren't paying them anything. You should try and go directly to, um, to the retail market so you can maybe make $100 a car or $200 a car for you know John and mm. Nancy that either get the versus the auto detailers are trying to basically get them for nothing. So long story short, um, I said, hey, I'm going to make a website for you in front page, probably the ugliest website ever <laughs> made in the history of the internet. But I did it. I did my keyword stuff early on from that, some of the stuff that I yeah. learned. And lo and behold, the guy, he got ranked and he started, started changing his business. It started changing his life. And I remember that call. He called me up. He's like, dude, I don't know what you've done, but this is, I can't thank you enough. So it was like that phone call that he called me and said that. And I was like, wow. I mean, this is what I was meant to do, right? Here's mm. something where I know I can make money for, but I just had the most rewarding experience ever where a guy just told me I changed his business and I changed his life. Changed his life holy yeah. cow, holy cow. I did this in front page, you know? It was, just, it was just a matter of me doing it and taking a step forward and saying, hey, you know what? I can do this. I can figure this thing out. Mm. Um, and I did. I just kind of self-studied my way into a silly little front page thing, got it up there. And again, 2005 is different than 2015 or 2017 in terms of getting this stuff to rank, but the fundamentals are still there. And, and, you know, the fact that you just take action and put stuff up there can, can really kind of change, change everything really for you. And yeah, for other that's people. right. I mean, it's a great story and I, there's, there's so much I like about it, but the one big message for me and it reinforces what I tell people a lot when, you know, they talk to me about SEO and, and, you know, the classic question I get, isn't there some magic trick you can use to get me onto the number one position on Google or get me on page one. And I say, well, no, there's, here's, here's the stuff you have to do, but you actually have to do some things. Um, and I said, you know, the, the whole industry uh, myth, I guess, that there's magic tricks or, or sort of golden keys to get to number one in Google is, is based on trying to trick Google. And yet when you boil it down, Google actually wants you to rank number one for the keyword and service that you are going to help your client with. And so if you, if you approach it with that angle, then you get to that point because, you know, I'm imagining Google because they want people to use the search engine so they can sell advertising. And if Google get that feedback that, hey, you know, ranking number one has changed my business and changed my life, um, that meets their needs as well. So everything's aligned. And I think the traditional kind of let's do something sneaky to get to number one is actually misses that point. Well said. I mean, perfect. Uh, exactly kind of how it's, it, it, how it's evolved. But it's interesting because for the longest time, at least the first 10 plus years of Google's existence, I mean, it was this cat and mouse game mm. of, um, I think a very primitive approach, to their algorithm, which was, Hey, let's figure out how, how to work words around the website or behind the website or hidden in the website. Um, and let's try and figure out how to do all sorts of these link schemes of backlinks back to a website where you could go out and 
you know, it was all about um, getting volume basically back in the day and figuring out different ways to kind of trick the system with these really one or two different, you know, variations of one or two different tactics to try and do these backroom yeah, yeah. things. So then, of course, about five years or so ago, Google came back and uh, really started to drop some nuclear bombs in terms of ranking <laughs> stuff. They, they started to make the, the algorithms more punitive in nature. So they didn't just take the good stuff and throw the bad stuff away. They started to knock you for the bad stuff you were doing. So that yeah, really yeah. changed behavior and changed the way people's approach. It brought a lot of stuff that people were maybe doing offshore, whether you're in maybe in Australia doing stuff offshore in Asia or, or you know, getting to these offshore things doing and really being more accountable for, for this uh, work that they were doing, kind of knowing more what was going on in terms mm. of people that were doing this kind of stuff. But more importantly than that, what I think Google's gotten really right, aside from really fundamentally changing behavior in the SEO industry, which is great because it's become more of a consulting-based service than it was kind of a backroom write-a-check, get-me-ranked type of a service, right? Yeah, yeah. That, that part of it's changed. But what I love about Google right now is – I look at Google and Google rankings more as almost a, um, a a marketing KPI. And the reason I say that is because they become really good at going out and measuring a variety of diverse signals, right? So it's your website and the way your website's structured and the way people interact with it and engage with it and how long they stay on it. But it's also, they're also measuring like, you know, your reputation, how you're getting online reviews and this kind of stuff, your social media participation, um, your content marketing, where your stuff's getting posted on your own website and other websites, your citation strategy, where you're getting your webs, your your business um, um, cited in 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 direct and high trust, high authority directories around the website, and collectively, right? And and when, you, when I map those things out like that, it doesn't start to sound like SEO anymore. It sounds more hmm. like digital marketing. You know what I mean? When you're doing all exactly, these pieces. Yeah. And the, the, the thing, though, is if you look through all those components through the lens of Google, it kind of helps you think about them in a way where you should tie them all together. Because I think the biggest mistake, on the other hand, people make is they hear all these things, but they end up doing these, like, tactics randomly. So mm -hmm. they hear blogging and they say, oh, I heard him say blogs. So let's just go blog more. Well, if you're not doing it strategically, meaning you didn't make your website the referral source for everything, you didn't do your keyword and topic research, or you don't know who your ideal clients are, then you're just blogging into thin air for nothing, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're, if you're thinking about who it is and you know how people are searching, you're baking that kind of stuff into your strategy and then you know, building your website kind of from the ground up with all these things kind of through like the SEO kind of Google lens, it's, I think, one of the best ways to tie things together. So to basically kind of approach digital marketing as if you were Google is what I think, you know, you get the benefit, of course, of getting better SEO rankings, getting ranked higher and getting those leads. But it also just helps you get, I think, more of a return on all of your digital marketing because it kind of makes them more more tied together versus kind of just randomly shot out there. Yeah, that's that's great advice. And I you know, I, I absolutely concur with you there. And one of the things that you said, and we, we usually start with this when, when we do any project, is who's who's the audience and what are they looking for? What are they expecting? You know, and how are you going to meet that expectation? And so that kind of informs the whole SEO and keyword strategy, if you like. Oh. It's, yeah. it's exactly. And I'll take it even a step further. I would go like, just to give you an example of something where we would say, okay, Let's take a process and see if we can stretch it out to get more wins off of it. Um, we think, of course, you know, blogging is like a really important tactic in all of digital marketing. There's several reasons for that. But if you subscribe to this is a great way to build authority, build organic content on your website, have something that you could then stare and distribute out there, then, then you know, then we kind of we're, we're all in agreement there. But what we do in turn, instead of just like ran, instead of writing strategic blog posts on single topics, what we do for ourselves and for our clients actually too is we go out there and say, Hey, you know what, if we're going to have this blogging strategy, let's have, let's create a blog series of 10 or 15 posts. Mm, okay. I love it. And yeah. then, and then we're going to have them so that they can independently be, you know, published as independent posts. But at the end of those, we're going to stitch those together so that they can become an ebook call to action. Right. Right. Mm. Then we're also going to take that same ebook and then convert it into a Kindle and make us or our clients an author up on Amazon so that they can then reach that audience, but also gain the authority of being a published offer type of thing. Right. Mm. Then we get that action and say, okay, we're going to use that to leverage maybe some PR or some things, or perhaps use it to launch maybe our own podcast campaign. Or now we've got something that's, you know, 
kind of launchable or a little bit of attractive type of thing where we've got some authorship, we've got taken that initiative um, now. So, so it's one of those things that really, if you, if you think about, okay, we know we got a blog. If you just blog, you know, once a week, that's great. If you optimize for it and distribute on social media, that's even better. But if you can think of ways to, to package these things, to really repurpose them in ways, to kind of, you know, again, with kind of that Google mentality, then you can get, you know, three, four, five, ten x out of out of one activity versus just um, just kind of doing a single op. And and I think that kind of approach, that that strategy that I just mentioned, is really kind of how I look at anything, um, whether it's you know getting up on podcasts or or doing blog posts or any approach to any type of digital marketing. Kind of take a see if you can take a look at it the way Google would look at it, and also look at it to see like let's just not do it just for the purpose of that thing. Are there other ways that we can we can get some more value out of it so that we get um, a bigger bang for the buck, basically. Mm. Yeah, I, I really love that, and I'm glad you kind of brought that up. I was going to ask about it because I heard you talking about it on some other podcasts, and I think it, I think you outlined it in the book, if I remember correctly. So, but that's that's really great, and I know. Awesome, you really did read it. Some people say they read it, but nah, nah. that's proof. That's proof. It is in the book. You're right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but, but I heard you talking about it on another podcast as well. So, um, yeah, Are you. you You've also mentioned, I think this was probably in the book as well, that you said 99% of websites fail, and I thought that was pretty harsh because I, I typically say 90% of websites just sit in cyberspace and do nothing but take up space. Um, so 99%. Well, if you think of the Internet and how many people actually rank on the first page and the, a lot of people go out and, you know, I think there's a statistic from like 2014. I can't remember if we put it in the book or not, but it's something. Google did a study with another agency here um, in the U.S. I think it was two or three years ago. And the number back then, it was something like 57% of small businesses, and I believe in the U.S., still don't even have websites. So um, you think of the ones that do, at least here in the U.S., I mean, our our small business or our business community is brainwashed with um, TV ads from GoDaddy and from Wix and Weebly and all these other ones that sell them for $25, $50 a month. And people just think that they should, you know, it kind of, it kind of, um, it kind of brainwashes people to think that, that, that websites are digital brochures and they're not, you know, they're working against trying to get the evolution of websites into marketing platforms. So it gets pretty tough to go in to be like, okay, if you've got to do this custom website or work with a marketing strategist, you're going to probably have to invest more um, than a GoDaddy web builder website because somebody's got to go in there and work with a strategy. So you build these things in a way that they become investments and not just digital brochures or expenses. So, I mean, I stand by that number. I think it's probably 99.9% .9 of new websites that go up there. Don't, they don't, and that's what ends up happening. I think people feel burned by the, the, um, the industry because it's like, you know, when you get a new website, and this is, I think, was a lot of people, what a lot of small businesses are struggling with. I think they think when they go out to get a new website that it's going to solve one of their marketing problems. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Job's and done. then and then they go get a pretty website and they got this honeymoon period, but then the phone doesn't ring anymore. Now all of a sudden they, they felt burned, even though the wherever the service they bought from, I'm sure most people don't say you do this and you're going to rank number one to make the phone rings. Hmm. I still think that they think that's what's going to happen. And then so the feeling of being burned is there because it's like, look, we tried this. Of course, we tell everybody usually, and you probably see this too, right, is that a lot of business owners that go out there and, and they can already sense that traditional, you know, random marketing doesn't work like it used to, right? Especially when I talk mm. to guys here in Kansas City, they're, um, especially the older generation, they're just like, whenever they needed more business, they did more yellow pages, they did a TV ad, they did a uh, radio ad or whatever it was. Yeah, yeah. And there was a predictable amount of sales that came off of that. Now when they do it, the phone doesn't ring at all and they're just like, what is going on? Mm. And I tell people, well, it's not that, it's just because you're creating the demand. This is demands going back to the internet and you're not there to catch it because you don't have any reviews. You can't find your website. They can't find information about you. So somebody else gets that business and not you. So I still think that kind of stuff still works. But again, this is, I think where people kind of feel like they get burned and kind of the reason why we try and make a, a strong statement there is like, let's think about your website as a marketing platform, as the referral source for everything that you're doing um, online and then position it as the revenue generating you know, asset that you need it to be versus just one of these things you go price shop to get the prettiest, you know, cheapest thing up there. So, mm, Yeah, I, I, that's, that's great. I couldn't have said that better. And I think part of the problem is that people do go price shop and, and the unfortunately there is a big section certainly here in Australia and I suspect it's the same around the world from the, some of the communities I'm in 
that you know there is this price shopping and oh, we can get it done cheaper somewhere else and we can outsource it to India or some or whatever and get get it for five hundred dollars and oh, and then you get this other uh, sentiment which is oh this color isn't quite right or this this little icon or this little text should be a couple of pixels over to the left to make it they get yeah they get caught up in the only thing they understand right yeah, which yeah. is maybe the pixels and not the other stuff <laughs> that they should right, be like. yeah. And and so it's a case of, well, is that going to get you business or not? Exactly. Exactly. Mm. Um, but one thing I will note on that is where we come in and, you know, a lot of times you can get kind of the traditional business owners to the light bulb will go off. And, and one of the things actually has been working for me really well in the last like two or three weeks to get this point across is I just on a hunch went back and looked at what the top the most valuable um, companies on the U.S. stock exchanges are. Hmm. And I showed them because there's actually a website that does this. And I wrote a blog post on it earlier this week because I was like, I see people's like eyes like pop up when, they, when we're in person telling them about it because it really it just shows them. I tell them what the top five most valuable companies in the U.S. right now. And in order, it's and it kind of shifts around, but it's basically Apple, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, and Amazon. Hmm. Now, if that doesn't tell you <laughs> where you should be focusing, you know, your marketing strategy, right? Yeah, that's right. These are the most valuable companies probably in the world, but definitely in the U.S. Um, and they're all some, they all represent some form of digital marketing. They represent the devices we consume content on. They represent the ways we find content. They represent the ways we socialize online. And that's what the, 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 the financial markets are telling us are the most valuable places and they're the top, they're the top five. It's like, so people are like, you know, if you don't figure this piece of it out, this is kind of where all the action is. You know, some of this stuff is passing you by. Then, mm. then my next piece of that is I actually have where we struggle sometimes because you still get people that are trying to like figure out, dip their toes in, in, in digital marketing. Um, you get the guys that are coming up and they're millennials here that are just getting some of those guys, I got a tree guy. I think he's like 29 years old. He does tree trimming and, and tree removal and that kind of stuff. Um, you talk to a millennial about the traditional forms of marketing and they're just like, that's not how we buy. I mean, they're already like natives. You know what I mean? Exactly. <laughs> they, yeah. They, um, and I'm using, I'm stealing the word that you and I think Kev, I can't remember in the last episode that you had, but a digital natives, I think is what one of the words that was used mm. there. I, I love that. But, but, um, it's true because you don't have to pitch a 29 year old entrepreneur in a home service that all the action is on you know, reputation reviews website. They totally get it. They're just like, we get it. We understand the value. Let's do it the right way. You know, here he comes in and we, we rank him on the first page. Number one, in a lot of cases he's got, I think 30 or 40 reviews where the guys that have been around town doing it for 30, 40 years have one or two. He looks like the guy that's been doing it for years, the go-to tree guy, you know mm. what I mean? Yeah, and he just right. jumped in, he's stealing market share away from, I just, I and mean, that's happening all over the place. I mean, um, but because these guys come in and they totally get it. They're not hesitant. They just say, this is where the action is. We're going to do it. And I find that they're a little bit more willing to invest, you know, in somebody that's got some, some skill in that area versus being not trustworthy, being more hesitant, you know, tipping, dipping their toes and that kind of stuff. And, and meanwhile, if they don't act fast enough, I think market share is lost and, and in some sense, you get you know get a sense that some things could you know basically pass them by if they don't they don't get going. So hmm. um, that's just my sense. Again, every market's a little bit different. We're here kind of in Kansas City. We've got about two point five million in the metro area, so it's not a huge city in the U.S., but it's it's definitely big enough to be competitive uh, online for this kind of stuff. So it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, it is fascinating, and I think what I've found is that there's as you say, there's the digital natives, uh, the younger people that have grown up with computers all their lives and, you know, their, their first port of call is Google if they want to find anything out. Um, and, you know, it's not by chance that Google is in the language. Like we don't go, we don't go on the internet to search for something, we Google it. And, the you know, they live that. But then, you know, when you look at the older generation, that I'm finding that a lot of those business owners that you know are smart and switched on realize this as well, uh, but they might be a little bit more intimidated by the whole thing. Yes. Yeah. I mean, a lot and of and afraid of getting burned, and because I think a lot mm. of ends up happening too is some sometimes they test the stuff out and they're testing with the worst providers out there, yeah. and then they get burned, and then there's a cycle of. 
but when your first when your first dip into digital marketing is from some cold caller that's really you know what I mean versus you doing your own yeah that's right yeah yeah then there's this self the cycle of you know going downhill because they're just like it doesn't work I don't trust it you know that kind of thing and then, then it that's right and they don't know enough about it to ask the right questions or um, you know keep control over something that that they've got no understanding of so they're totally at the mercy of their provider. But, um, yeah, exactly. Hmm. Interestingly enough, when I still go out and talk to people, I still think we're kind of in the golden age of inbound marketing, maybe still in the early phases of it. I mean, I've been doing it a while, so it seems like, geez, it's been out. But in reality, it's a small percentage of companies, and so many companies still need this help and need to kind of you know, tie hmm. it all together and get it right. And there's just kind of starting to get really new tools out there, I think, to help you you know, plug it all together with uh, marketing automation and that kind of stuff. So. Um, I think this is going to be, you know, something that's going to be around and in some sense still, like I said, kind of right in the middle of it or maybe still in the right in the beginning of it, which is yeah, going to sound yeah. weird, weird well, to yeah. some digital you know, marketers have been doing this for a while. Well, yeah, I mean, my background's, uh, you, you mentioned earlier about not being a native of the industry and so on. My background's in chemistry, so I'm not a native of the industry either, but I've always been into computers and back in 1997 or 1998, we set up a website in their company I was working for, a global website that's still around today. And the idea there, we coined the term authority authority website, authority content. Nice. And we put that together. And this was, Google wasn't around then. So this was, Google started in 98, I think. And we were doing keyword research through uh, Yahoo!, and we were doing search engine optimization through Yahoo in a small team, and that um, you know that website actually turned around the business that we were working for. So it's a, it's a little bit of a parallel story, I guess, uh, to the um, River Pool story with Marcus Sheridan. But we were doing it in 1998 in the corporate world, and that philosophy of providing you know useful content to the audience and the right audience and talking you know, talking their problems, talking their language and giving them solutions that they needed, um, for me became the philosophy. And so when I went into starting my own web company and that, that, that was the way I approached the whole lot. And all these uh -huh. big, all these big um, Google ranking updates and so on where suddenly the internet was abuzz with, oh, my rankings have slipped and so on. I remember the yeah. first first time I saw that and I thought, oh, I better go and check all my websites. And basically, if anything, they'd improved. So, you know, I thought, well, I must be doing things right. So, you know, and, and that philosophy still today is is what's working. So it's not as if it's new. Wow, that's pretty amazing. I don't think I heard – the first time I heard Google, I think it was 99 – yeah, um, I'm pretty sure they like started around, out of the garage in '97. That's right. Yeah, yeah. But, um, of course. It yeah, was I a remember. Years. I remember finding it first, and I thought, "Hey, there's this new search engine. I'm going to play around with this." So it was like everybody I was talking to was saying, oh, "I never heard of it." You know, stop. Yeah, we had one of the guys in Asia that was a, I guess, a you know, Silicon Valley startup that we were trying to raise money for and he mentioned it to me and I was like that sounds cool hmm. and I remember that being the first time that I ever even heard of it was some other days just mentioned it and it was like an offline yeah. an offline you know recommendation to find it, which is funny now now it's a word in the dictionary <laughs> that's right yeah yeah so who, who would have known then but yeah but the idea of you know providing content to your audience and and making it such that you know they want to come back to that website because there's likely to be new content there and there's likely to be something there that's of use to them um, was you know that that was something we were doing then and if you think back you know because what wow, we mo awesome. what we modeled this off was I, I used to go to trade shows where you know you'd go around and spend the whole day collecting brochures from all the different stands and you'd have a bag full of brochures at the end of the day and then you'd go through and clean them all out and you'd kind of filter it down to a small number of brochures that you would then read because they were of interest and they, they spoke to a problem that you had or a need that you had. Um, and I looked at that and I thought, well, online you could basically do the same sort of thing but you can do it much quicker and it's available all the time rather than having to wait for the next trade show. So that was really, you know, it's not a new concept it's been around forever really oh. yes 
but it's to kind of just starting to take critical mass now that it's yeah, become yeah. the buzzwords and people are starting to kind of understand it and kind of doing it a little bit more. And But I like to yeah. emphasize that because, you know, coming back to what I said earlier where you get this question about, oh, can't we have a magic pill and, you know, technology and can't we automate this and can't we just turn a switch and we become number one? Well, no, it's not. that's not how it works. It's really, you know, the internet just makes things easier. It's not it doesn't change the fundamentals of you have to provide value, you have to build a relationship, you have to talk to the right audience, you have to actually get their attention. And uh. I, I mean, I couldn't agree more. And one of the things I like to try and I've really been focusing on actually this year, but you're kind of making a point of it already, which is, um, you know, Google came out and they've always had for a number of years now, they've had a army of quality raiders, right? Yeah. So they've got, I think it's over 10,000 quality raters now, people that they pay, it's like around 15 or 20 bucks an hour to literally go and like manually check the results, right? So, and provide feedback based on the quality of the results. So I think one of the most important documents in SEO, probably in all of marketing right now, is the 57-page Google quality raters guidelines, which anybody can Google and download the PDF. But I always, I check it out every year, and they change it already three times this year, um, and they just change it again actually this week. But I think what was, what's really changed, and I think part of this is probably uh, because of the political election and the fake news and all the stuff that's kind of been happening global, globally is, um, you know, the internet was already kind of not a super trustworthy place, hmm. which put the onus on you to do the due diligence and do your own kind of, you know, make your own decision on the quality of the content you were reading. <laughs> If people establish that they were an authority or trustworthy, then, of course, you make a decision based on it. But what's interesting about the, the latest revisions of the Google Quality Rater Guidelines is the things that they emphasize to the raters, and that is education, authority, and trust. They actually have this acronym mentioned over and over again that you're looking for these factors where you can look, and they basically give you examples of how to do that, right? So they're saying, when I mean, you go to a website, make sure that you see you know, the authority, you see these trust signals. Make sure they're trying to educate. And if they're telling their quality raters, this is because they're basically giving a manual grade of the algorithm, right? They're, yeah. they're almost kind of telling you what the answers are That's by right. telling you what to look at. So if they're emphasizing these things, then you want to make sure that your website is showing these things um, to the algorithm. So all this stuff of, you know, making sure that you're, you're up there, you've got a detailed about us page, you show your address, you know, things that make you very trustworthy, where you got contact information, you're blogging, you're showing yourself as an authority, you're showing that you're maybe who you're, um, some reviews and testimonials, all the things that, you know, I look as almost kind of proving to a customer, almost kind of like you're in a court of law, right? You're trying to prove that you're a real person. Hmm. You're not hiding stuff. You're not hiding it. You're putting it all out there. I think Google's really trying to go out there and crawl websites and look for these things that established um, trust and authority, um, which means we have to do that as marketers or even people that are selling market services. So um, kind of gets back to what you were saying, just about all these things of how we should be doing this time all together, how we should be blogging. Um, but there's really practical reasons to do that because um, if you look through that quality raters guidelines, it will really kind of, I think, shine a little light into the soul of the algorithm. Um, and it helps you again. It, it, to me, again, I get back to kind of like thinking thinking about Google or doing marketing with an SEO mindset. It's just one of these things where if you're if you kind of have Google in the back of your mind, like for example, you're not necessarily writing blog posts for the search engines, but you shouldn't be writing one or really doing anything without kind of thinking in the back of your mind um, if there's any SEO benefits or implications that you can make that might help you with Google. Because if you're doing that, you're probably um, finding ways to get more benefit out of the content anyway and not just through Google. Um, mm. So that's, that's a, kind of a nice little insider tip if you, if you can. It's, it's a really easy read, again, because it's not – I mean, it's easy. It's 57 pages, but it's meant for just, you know, this army of quality raters that they have. It's not like they're trying to get, um, s you know, super skilled – over-educated people to, you know, do the, it's just regular people they're trying to bring on board, right? So that they can make these assessments with these instructions that they get. So it's a pretty easy read, I think, for any of us because it's written for people that are not necessarily industry insiders or, or technical people. It's just written for anybody to be able to go to a website and say, is this trustworthy? Is it showing that there's an authority in this, you know, that kind of stuff? And, and it gives you yeah. kind of the, the keys and the tools to do that. And if you take that in, I think you can just make your website and your whole marketing, you know, a lot better because there's some just some great points in there. 
Yeah, that's a great recommendation. And we'll have a link to that one in the show notes. I think, you know, one of the things that I say a lot to people is if you, if you go through the information that Google actually published, and there's a lot of other stuff that they publish, so some of it is a bit more technical, obviously, uh, but they actually tell you how you rank number one. They actually tell you what, you know, what they, how they do the ranking factors. And, and so if you take those things into account in your strategy, then, you know, there's a good chance that you'll be successful. Um, whereas a lot of people are still looking for that magic bullet. So. Right. Mm. All right. Um, I wanted to ask about video, video and SEO because I know, you know, there's a big push now on video and Facebook has got their live thing that's that's getting a lot of attention now. A lot of people are doing Facebook Live. YouTube Live's been around for a while. Um, doesn't seem to have gotten as much attention. Um, so what what's your take on video and SEO? Yeah, I have some very specific things. I mean, Google's come out I mean, recently a couple of times and said through their spokespeople that, you know, does, you know, there's a, there's a thought in the SEO community that the more rich media you have on a web, web page, the better on-page signal that you get because there's more reference content or just richer media and that kind of stuff. And they've come out and said, no, just putting a video, embedding a video, even if it's relevant or not, doesn't um, directly impact the maybe ranking potential of that page. But what they don't say and what a lot of people are really hot on is that if you've got a nice video on your webpage that's embedded or native or whatever it is, um, one of the pe things that people believe that they can prove is that if the dwell time on a page is high enough, meaning the length of time they spend on a single page, then they can correlate that to higher rankings. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a good text on there, good rich media, and you have a video that keeps people on because they listen to the rhetoric, well, then theoretically they're increasing. So they're indirectly helping it. It's not the video itself that's saying you added the video or giving you points, but they play the video and you're on the site longer, so the dwell time increases. So then that, that's a quality signal for Google, right? And then they rank. So Google doesn't come out and say any of this is true, but people have been able to say, look, I've done this. I've got 1,500, 2,000 words down this long form blog post. I put video on it and um, it's high quality and relevant. People are playing it. Um, they say, okay, now we can, we can potentially improve the ranking potential of that page. That's one thing I think um, that could potentially help for folks. But what I see video for, and I actually been shooting video even today to practice what we preach, is I think video on your website does two things for you. One, if, you're, if you can show your face that you're talking, I think that's a major, major trust signal to people that are visiting yeah. versus a static picture. So they're on your website. They stay longer. There's some ranking potential there. But just the fact that somebody can see and get to know, like, and trust you on your website before they leave because, you know, most people, if they're going to buy a local service or any service really – um, are interested who's behind the company and might at least want to get a first impression. Mm. Uh, and then even more than that, I think, because what I think the biggest, if you want to call a silver bullet, the closest thing that we have to a silver bullet today is probably online reviews or different kinds of reviews and testimonials. Because that's per, at the end of the day, that's how we buy everything. Mm. You search on Google, top choices come up. Then you're just looking for who the person is. If they've got the most reviews, whether it's on Amazon or Google, whatever it is, usually you're going to get a chance to get that call and perhaps warm them up so much that they, you know, they're pre-sold by the time that they get to you. But if you can go to a website, and like one of the things that we're doing during for some of our clients are is um, to get actual testimonial reviews, right? Yeah. Now you're talking about jacking the conversion Pardon. rates because – you've got somebody that's vouching for you in person in video that's saying these guys do, you know, I'm an actual customer and they did a great job. Um, again, just kind of increases the conversion potential, which I think ties to SEO and to some degree, but it also keeps people on the site longer, which we're pretty sure. In fact, some of us would say we know is going to help you um, with SEO as well. So that's my extent of it. I'm actually looking at it for those reasons for conversion purposes or to getting people to trust the site more or to stay on the site longer is kind of so certain. Yeah, so one of those things, again, where if you say just video, any video, well, it's kind of like just doing any blogging. Yeah. Um, if you've got a purpose or a reason for it in a way that I think that can really help you, then, then yeah, I think it can be a huge help. But sometimes, again, people will hear, they just say video helps SEO, so they just start churning out junk videos, and then that doesn't help you at all and might even hurt you, right, if it's low quality or doesn't achieve some goal. So that's kind of mm -hmm. my uh, – that's yeah, my yeah. current view on, on video stuff. I will say one thing. I mean, I think some people – a little bit are chasing the Facebook Live. The, what the, 
you know, I, the one thing I don't like about Facebook Live, I say two things. One is I think the view count's misleading. So people talk about how many views it's had, but I, there's a lot less people that say, I got this many views and I got this many sales. But they still chase the views because for whatever reason they got it on there. So I'm a little bit skeptical of, the, of that thing personally, which is why I don't, I'm not investing in it so much. The other thing is I'm still such a big believer in your website should be the referral source yeah. for all your content. So I'd much rather have the video on the website and share the link. And if somebody wants a video, they got to go to my website to see it versus watching it and staying on Facebook. And I'm, that's going to be hard to, unless I see some clear evidence for me personally, then I'm probably not going to invest too much in it. But of course, let other folks do it. And if they find a way to, to make it work, then I'll, then I'll jump in. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, that's, that's uh, great advice. So, they, I mean, there's a couple of things there that I think are worth highlighting. So, first of all, using video as, as uh, a way to build trust because if people see the business owner speaking live on camera as opposed to just an image of them or even worse, not even that, um, that does definitely build the trust. And I really like the video testimonials idea. I'm, in fact, I, I know we've got that on a couple of our websites but I probably should start doing that a lot more as a rule rather than the exception and um, and the idea of having your website as as the central place for the information is good too so I'm playing a little bit with Facebook live but I'm still in two minds about it and also I, I tend not to look at the numbers of people there um, because that to me is a little bit of a vanity metrics I, it's like you say, it's really right. more I'll about be following you to see how that works. So again, <laughs> yeah. if, if people say it really it, to me, it's again, yeah, I just haven't seen too much repeat. and it looks good. I think it works and you do get some attention. I also, I actually do like the way some folks are using it for the, you know, how the, the ads cause it, they start to roll when you go down. So that obviously there's, there's some things in there that yeah. I think probably do work well for some folks, but just yeah, again, for me, for me, I think the, the potential of Facebook Live is is around building the community. You know, we talked mm -hmm. earlier about yes. uh, traffic audience and community. And so for me, I think it's a longer-term strategy of building the community rather than having, you know, the Facebook being where you, your video assets right. are. That makes because, perfect sense. Hmm, because as you say, you know, you want to have people come to the website to see your stuff. And, and, and I think then, to some extent, you know, Facebook wants you to do that, right? Because you get them back to the site. Now you've pixeled and, and, and tagged them with the Google remarketing tag and you can stock them and follow along. Or if they're just hanging out on your Facebook page, you never get the chance to exactly, kind of customize yeah. that audience, that kind of stuff. Hmm. All right. Well, this has been fascinating. I could go on for ages. Um, all right. Me too. <laughs> heaps of notes here, and but we don't want to spoil the book for anybody that does hasn't read it do we so I, I will post the link there for the book seo for growth that has a lot of this information in there um, but of course um there's there's some additional bits and pieces that phil's elaborated on here what i'd like to do though is go on to the buzz which is our innovation round that's designed to help our audience who are primarily innovators and leaders in their field with some tips from your experience so I've got five questions and hopefully you'll have some really insightful answers that will inspire everyone to go and do something awesome today. Let's do it. Yeah. All right. So what's the number one thing anyone needs to do to be more innovative? I think, I mean, my personal opinion, I think um, just taking action. I think a lot of people, especially the people that are like listening to podcasts, or we're, these are already the folks that are kind of in there and getting it and doing it. But I think a lot of people think, to some extent how I did, but, but, you know, I, once I took that plunge out into Asia, I really kind of gave me the confidence to think, Hey, I can pretty much do anything I put my mind to. Hmm. Um, but in, you still get every once in a while, one of these things like, gosh, would it be nice to start my own podcast someday? Or would it be nice to start, you know, my book, that would be such a nice, you know, career bucket list type of a thing to do. Um, and I thought this when I joined the duct tape marketing network, three years ago, somebody dropped the book that they wrote as a group project in that network. And I was like, God, I'd love to do this someday in the next 10 years. <laughs> Lo and behold, I had my first bestseller in six months. Yeah. Just because I took action on it. Somebody gave me an opportunity. I jumped right on it. And it was like not nearly as hard as I thought it was. 
think somebody goes start starting your own website project. Man, I just jumped in and said, you know what? I'm going to figure this front page thing out. Of course, I don't even think that's around anymore. But so, <laughs> I mean, is that I don't know if we'd call that innovation or not. To some degree, it is. It's it's thinking about something, thinking about an opportunity, figuring out a way to kind of monetize it or do something in a way that benefits you, and then actually taking action on it and not thinking about it as one of these things like you hear these guys, well, I've had this idea to do something. Well, dude, the way that works right now, like when I was in, when I was uh, uh, 20 years ago or whatever it was, when I got out of school, it was impossible to do side hustles and gigs the way it is right now. You know what I mean? Hmm. Now you could literally go to all these places and, and launch a business idea with for pennies on the dollar because you got all sorts of people that will help you on the cheap. Um, so that'd be my first thing is just to, to, when you think about things in terms of being innovative or news, new ideas, don't be afraid to like act on them because if you don't, without action, there's nothing. Nothing right? happens. So, yeah. That's, that's great advice. And, and a lot of people overthink things and procrastinate and want to perfect something before they put it out in the wild. Um, so effectively they never take action and nothing ever happens with it. So I think that's great advice. Yeah. All right, what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas or new products? <laughs> Might be the same answer. <laughs> it's pretty similar, although yeah. if I had to pin down something that really helped, I mean, I was so zeroed in with the SEO blinders for a number of years that, you know, I, we mentioned how Google kind of went out and started expanding things, and I kind of saw that they were grading a greater, you know, universe of marketing signals. Um, so then I went for me, what really opened the doors uh, was kind of getting involved with duct tape marketing. And that's when they, he really you know, the approach of figuring out your ideal customers and kind of building everything around the, those people. So um, I think that that approach of kind of looking at, at problems or solutions or things um, from the way people are the ideal person, whoever it is, and then trying to reverse engineer that. Cause that's really what I've always done with SEO is, Hey, don't just try and build something and game it. Let's figure out how people are searching for it and then build content around the search activity versus doing it after the fact. Mm. And that's the way a lot of marketing is done right now, right? Let's figure out who the ideal client is. And instead of just randomly creating client, let's go interview these folks and figure out what it is they really like, and then just create content around those folks. And then everything else kind of builds around it. So that kind of approach I guess has really changed the way I think about things is if there's a new product or a new service, let's really think about the problem that we're solving and the people, especially the people that you know, you're trying to solve it for and then work backwards from that. And that I think is, is, um, is new for me anyway. I think it's helped me think about a lot of different things. If I'm going to undertake a new project or a new side hustle myself, um, I'm always kind of thinking it from that lens. Yeah, that's, that's great advice. And I think thinking of the ideal client and, putting together a real deep understanding of what their expectations are, what their needs and problems and what, they, what they're what they looking for, and then reverse engineering. I think that's really good. And it's something that dawned on me recently because I was doing a presentation at a, a retreat we ran in Thailand about this nice. very thing. And it, it dawned on me that, um, you know, and we were doing an exercise where we were working with the business owners to, to find their ideal client. And I realized that you can use this model for everything. So if you're looking to build partnerships, you can do this ideal partner exercise, which essentially is the same thing. So what's a partner going to be looking for in another partner? And then reverse engineer that and figure out, you know, um, who's a good fit for you and what kind of things do you need to be giving them to warm up the relationship so that you can start that uh, partnership journey. And likewise for suppliers, and then it dawned on me that you could actually turn it right around and do wow. one, yeah. do an ideal client exercise on yourself as oh, yeah. something for you know the suppliers to work on, and then go to your suppliers and say, "Here's my needs and my expectations and my frustrations and my fears, and here's how I like to consume stuff, and this is the sort of thing I." look for online and so on. So you've got all this information. So let's see what you can deliver. So exactly. yeah, good. So yeah. And, and I know that duct tape marketing is a, cause going back to when I first started this whole um, ideal client stuff, duct tape marketing was one of the, the models I really worked this off. So that's definitely great. Yeah. I mean, it definitely changed. Cause again, I came from finance and then I got into SEO and I got that technical thing and, 
it really just kind of opened my eyes up to kind of, I guess, what, you know, obviously folks like you have already kind of been doing for a while. But, um, but yeah, once you kind of figure out that piece, it's like, let's just not think of something because it's cool and then make it and hope people <laughs> yeah. will buy it, right? It's like, you know, focus on, on, on the folks and the solution and then work back. And then that's can be, like you said, can be used anywhere. Yeah, that's right. All right. Well, what's your favorite tool or system for improving your own productivity? My own productivity. I mean, um, the one doesn't really come to mind, although mm. I will say, I will say, I think products and tools, especially when you're doing, really, I guess anything right now, I'm thinking in terms of an agency or an SEO service providers, we're always constantly looking for something that's going to help us, but it can't be a marginal benefit, right? Yeah. And that's what a lot of the new things do. They're helping you save or make 10% more. If I some, I'm always looking for things that are like no brainers that maybe are, you know, bring in 10 times what they can bring versus just that. And I think being able to make sure that you don't go after each little shiny object because there's, we're as marketers and the way this inbound marketing is evolving. I mean, there's just tons of new tools being thrown at you all the time. Right. And everyone's trying to leapfrog exactly, each yeah. other and it's like, which one should I try? And then you get invested on the onboarding and that kind of stuff. So it's almost like just being your best productivity tool is you making sure that you don't get sucked into the next <laughs> yeah. shiny thing. Right. <laughs> That's Having right. Some discipline. Yeah. Um, well, but I'm always on the lookout, and this, again, it, it could be a group. So part of my productivity answer would be, you know, having discipline yourself, not to go after shiny stuff, but also be a member of groups of people or, or masterminds or whatever it is. Um, I have to, again, be a part of duct tape. There's 120 of us. We all kind of do the same stuff, and a lot of other people are always testing other things out, and then you're in this group that you're on, wherever, whatever it is, and you're kind of sharing that idea. So being able to you know, rely on other people that are actually using stuff in the field in your realm or whatever is going to be hugely valuable, right? Because if somebody in your group that you trust says, man, I tried this and it is awesome, then you're going to try it versus, you know, seeing something or getting sold yourself because somebody else, you know, got in somebody else's marketing funnel or something and, hmm. and believed something that was coming down. So, you know, that's I, how, how it, I think helps me because I'm relying on, on a little bit myself, my own discipline, but also listening from other people that have been guinea pigs and then making and then making choices on on new solutions that way. And that's really helped me quite a bit. I mean, I've actually got a few tools out there that I think are, you know, been able to, for us to be able to add a ton of value to our clients for relatively low amount of cost. And that's what we're all trying to do right now, right? Not just marginally mark something up because then it ends up being um, not very profitable. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's all about return on investment, right? Which is one right. of the points you make in your book. Um, yeah, that's great advice. I, I, I definitely agree on the, well, both of the points, uh, not getting into sucked into the shiny objects. I mean, I've, I'm, I'm a fan of shiny objects and I've got to discipline myself to not do that. And, and also the groups uh, being involved in the groups. So I'm in a, a couple of groups that are really valuable to me and I saw your, your WP elevation. That's that one's always kind of intrigued me. Yeah, that's uh, right. That's that's the big one. So I'm actually a mentor of that group, but you know, oh, it's nice. great to get into that group and and find out what other people are doing and share experiences and it's a very giving community. So it's it's very much like you say. I'm sure it um, saved you a ton of and people in there a ton of money just by listening to folks instead absolutely. of absolutely because it can get expensive if you don't go and like lean on then all of a sudden you're like and, yeah. and, you know, every once in a while, i got to go clean out the things that I've tried and add credit cards to just because you're trying to see if it works. So I had to kind of cut that That's out. right. Yeah. 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 All right. Um, and what's the best way to keep a project or a client on track? Um, you know, we. my biggest weakness is that I'm, I'd say I'm a perfectionist or something like that, but I'm always – I'm like kind of at heart kind of a yes man. I, I've got to take a lot of pride in my work, and I always want to make people happy, right? Um, and that's just kind of how I've approached business is that you want to try and keep your reputation as high as possible. The problem with that is uh, sometimes when you're in any kind of space, at least in the business that we're in, or I'm in, um, if you start saying yes off spec without charging, you cheapen yourself immediately, one. And two, you start sliding down this slippery slope of um, – things because you just all of a sudden said yes to one thing. Why aren't you saying yes mm. to this and that, right? So so the best way I keep the stuff on track is really to try and document that front end and have a blueprint or a plan. And this is the one thing I think I'm probably really good at because there's other pieces of the parts of our business where I, I probably, you know, all for all these years I've been doing it, almost kind of still run my business in some ways as a solopreneur. 
Um, but when it comes to what we're going to deliver to the client or a project or something like that, I'm really, I think, pretty strong about trying to treat every project like we're building the house and get those architect blueprints and people have sign off on them and make sure that they're set in stone. And then when we commence doing the project, any change is treated like a change order. And then all of a sudden, it sounds like you're being strict, or, but you're really kind of just making sure it goes on. Um, and, and you're also making sure that you're preserving your own value for the things that you're doing. That was a really hard thing for me to, to accept because I went for years and years with saying, oh, I'm going to be such a great guy because I'm not going to, I'm not going to charge people a down payment or I'm going to say yes to everything. You get yes yourself into like out of business. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so that's really has been me is really having good documentation up front, having a good process and, and almost beating a dead horse. Like I'll ask folks, you know, if we're going to commence, say like the coding phase of a website, you know, two or three or four times saying this is really it. If any changes after this point, you know, type of thing that we're going to do it. And and that's helped me out quite a bit. And then because once that's done and you got those things forward, then the project goes on and people are really clear about what they've got to do if there's any, any changes or upgrades or that kind of stuff. Hmm. Again, I think yeah. I'm, I'm hopefully not being too specific. My only frame of reference is what I've been doing the last 12 years. And yeah. and this now has made my life a lot less stressful yeah. by doing this, actually. So. I think that's great advice, and I think that's that's been a big lesson that I've learned over the years to make sure you have a really clear spec, and then and then be fairly firm on you know that's outside spec, and we can do that, but it will have these implications and this cost, um, you know, because sometimes making a change will impact on something else that was in the spec originally. So there's you know there's two things: it's the cost plus the it might sort of negate something else that we're trying to do. I like well, especially any clients that don't know the business. I mean, a lot of times you do something that looks, a small change to them looks like the two changes you might have that look small to the client or yeah. look large to the client. One might be actually technically very complex and take a long time to, you know, bug fix or change or figure out a solution. The other one might be instant, right? Just press mm -hmm. an update button and we're, they don't know. They just, you, do, you know what I mean? All of a sudden you've, but the problem is you've created a, you know, some sense of conflict there because you haven't, you know, spelled that kind of stuff up or what that's mean. right yeah i love your analogy to the house building because i remember when we we had our house built and i essentially project manage it but the builder had this very clear clear brief and design brief and everything was spelled out and you know along the way we came back and said oh actually having seen that now can we add this or can we change that and you know they were all, always very accommodating but in in the way they did it was yeah, sure, we can do that. It'll take us, you know, a couple, of, and it might um, stretch the delivery time by two weeks, and it'll cost this much extra. And that was it. You know, so then we had it there, and we could make a decision whether we wanted to make the change or not based on that. But right, but in the, if you, in the world of web design, I found that it's for some reason, unless you spell it out, it's it's the one business out there where I think there's some sense that you know almost once you build it you're kind of if there's like this warranty to always fix things or come back to yeah, it yeah. Or not. so unless you kind of spell that stuff out and you start doing a lot of websites and don't have the, these things um you know on like say on track or scheduled out then you know if you got a hundred or three hundred or five hundred websites behind you and some of them are coming back all of a sudden it's like you created this monster yeah because and and they expect these things to happen without if you didn't ever spell out what you know was there a maintenance plan in place or was there some agreement on how much, you know, to pay for time and hmm. um, then those things can come back and bite you um, over the years. Yeah. So, yeah, that's great advice. Yeah, that, it, it, I'm also reminded of one thing I did want to ask you during the our discussion and that's around content. You know, we talked about the importance of content and so on. And in terms of um, a web project, I mean, content is always the, the thing that's the hardest to, get from clients and wow amen <laughs> so it's not just yeah <laughs> oh yeah tell me about it yeah so do you have any advice <laughs> i mean i'm kind of looking around for does somebody have a magic solution for this and there probably isn't a magic bullet just like with everything else <laughs> i feel that there's not really one um hmm. Just only, I mean, if in our case and maybe if there's one out there so everybody's probably at the end of the day especially when you're working with small businesses, larger small businesses where the owners work in, in the business, not yeah. on the business all the time. Um, certainly for like we have, I don't know how many lawyer law clients that we have. Those guys, they get really busy and tied down. They come up for air every once in a while. I mean, it's just, 
I think part of it's the nature of the beast. Now we do try and offer things. It works great when it's a it's relatively simple business and if you can provide content marketing for them and get your head around the business, um, the ones that move the fastest obviously where we're able to kind of either outsource or write, help them write the content or at least interview you know, and do that kind of stuff for them because then we're in charge of the content and it happens really, really fast, right? Yeah. Um, but to get the best stuff, I think really you have to have some of their input and they have to be accountable for the stuff on there. And usually they do, to some extent, want to go over and read this stuff because, you know, the people that do on there, they want to make sure of it. And sometimes, and that just takes time, right? Um, bigger mm-hmm. clients with people in-house that they can, they've had an internal project manager, obviously that can move around a lot faster. But for, certainly for the smaller businesses, I mean, I just don't think there's any way to, to, to speed it up. You're just kind of at the mercy of content sometimes. Hmm. Uh, yeah, it was, doesn't, and it doesn't even matter. I've got like a, we've got guys, you know, people, project managers in my own thing. Where it's, we should do this and we should schedule it out. But you can schedule it and you can tell them you can put deadlines all day. But at the at the end of the day, I mean, they need the time. And sometimes they just don't have the time because hmm. they're you know they're well. That that's the that's the major issue, and they they don't see that it's that critical. They don't you know often they don't understand that the whole thing really stands and falls on the content. Um, so I've I've started doing you know, interviewing and getting to know the business and uh, sort of playing around with how can I structure the interview process that I can get the information in the business's voice and but all the information that I really need and then just essentially transcribe it and clean it up and, and there's the content. But it's still it's still not ideal. That's probably the best best way. I mean, I know folks on the Duct Tape Network do that. Hmm. Um, I haven't. We haven't worked that in, but we probably should. I mean, that's the best way to do that is get. But then that's your, again, that's your time. And if all of a sudden, you know, you're it's just, it's tough, I think, for, because we're getting kind of knee deep into like agency type stuff. But uh, yeah, content, that's just the trickiest piece. Because, you know, once you get that blueprint down, everybody, you know, you're, you're crunching out the mechanics of it. But how many of us have built, uh, especially you've got web design folks in here, you get you get a website that's like 90% done and you're waiting mm. weeks and weeks to like that's the right. last 10%. <laughs> yep, yep, the um, content, yeah. So when are we going to launch this website? Well, as soon as we've got the content. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, the fifth question in there, we got sidetracked there a little bit. The fifth question is, what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? Well, this is probably one of my favorite, but, but I, I think, the, again, the, the one thing, you ask the question, can you do to differentiate that? And I think that's just to take action to differentiate yourself, right? Because um, I'm going to give you an example of myself. I mean, I, I come, I'm truly, I would consider myself a true introvert. And I mean that by like, not like I'm shy or anything. It's like when I go out and talk or if I'm having a sales meeting, it drains me like emotionally and actually physically, right? I think that's the nature of being an introvert. So yeah. I never really got out there and put myself out there, did interviews, did podcasts. You know, I didn't really blog until a few years ago. Um, everything was kind of just behind the scenes and kind of a more technical person. But what what I think you have to do now, and I see the way this works myself, is you got to really get yourself out there and prove that you're an, an authority in your niche. And the more you can do that by you know posting content, getting involved, um, trying to write books and and you know interview people and do podcasts and these kind of things, um, the other guys aren't doing it. And the extent that you can do it and show your action, it looks you start to raise your um, your position basically in your in your niche and you work from being not an influencer to becoming a, a micro influencer to maybe becoming an influencer in your tribe or your group and we all no matter how big or small they are we all you know we all got a group of people eventually um, that we know that, that look to us for some type of advice is it 10 people is it 100 people is it 1,000 people is it 100,000 people um, but that really that part of it just taking action to kind of look at yourself um, as or to, to have that goal to be uh, a looked on as an authority in your niche, I think is something that everybody should, should look to do in the thing that they're going after they're doing in their life or their career. And I've kind of made that the bullseye for myself, right? So I'm it's okay. I'm really into this. I'm really into SEO. I'm into, into SEO driven websites. I want to make sure that everything I do, you know, we're going to kind of build around that. So I went and just kind of attacked that. And that's always kind of the goal that I have. So I then make sure that I go out and try and create relationships. And I purposely joined the duct tape market so that I had a way. I looked at different courses and things to go after. I'm going to give you an example. I looked at different courses and things to go after. That kind of stuff is great. But the thing that I like about John's group 
is that he has the courses and the baseline things you can go in and kind of do passively, but he's got the network where I had the chance mm. to join it and then actually personally go meet him a couple times a year and then prove myself. And then what did that happen? I said, I, did this. I, started, I started to blog for him. I started to do some little bits of stuff to work for him on the side. And then he built enough trust up in me that I actually approached him to write a book and trying to ride his coattails and of influence to try and help that leverage my own, right? Yeah. So again, it just comes to this piece of having that picture of yourself and picturing yourself, I think, as an authority and then working towards that goal. Because I think for some of us, like I'm maybe a little bit shy by nature. It's like, gosh, to be an authority, you got to be out there and talk about a lot of people. Well, no, if, mm -hmm. if you can actually confidently picture yourself you know, as an authority and something you're interested in, then you, you have that and you just got to take action to start working for it. There's lots of things we can do online that, you know, over time can help us accumulate authority. And that, that I think is the ultimate differentiator, um, at least in the space that I'm in. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's great advice. Uh, so basically it's take action, get out there and get involved and, you know, you've and think of yourself as an authority because you got to, you really have to be, it doesn't, it doesn't even matter if you're whatever, even home service is a plumber, a tree, tree service guy, a lawyer. I mean, show something that shows like you are the market leader, you're the leader, your opinion matters. Um, hmm. There's all sorts of things you can do that. And that to me is when you land on a website, if you land on a plumbing website or whatever it is, um, you know, they're all look the same unless you can say, this guy's got 50 reviews, this guy's got two, this guy has an ebook, this guy has none, this guy blogs, this guy hasn't blogged in five years. You know, all of a sudden it's like you're doing these things because you've made that, that authority piece kind of the goal of what you're trying to do. And then you've built this body of work, again, on the referral source of your website. And now you've really, truly differentiated yourself and you've made somebody pretty clearly, maybe in 20 or 30 seconds when they land on your website, that you are differentiated from the other guys and you're the clear choice or the person to follow or the person to buy from. And that's kind of my, so is that like, <laughs> you asked for one number one thing, that's kind of a lot of things. In <laughs> well, one, that's great. I mean, if it's one <laughs> well, thing, it's like, think of yourself as an authority and act on you know, making that a reality. Yeah, no, that's great advice. And and it's funny because we, we've just launched a um, plumber's website. Um, he's, he's in the industrial plumbing area, but um, one of the things that, um, I'm working with him on is putting putting up authority content based on you know his extensive knowledge, which he has a lot. Um, so I think I'll um, play him that last bit of recording that he just said there. It's not just Excel. me saying it. You yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this has been great. Thanks, Phil. What's uh, what's the future for you of uh, SEO for growth for Kansas City Web Design? Yeah, the one interesting thing was, you know, again, again, I've got this kind of, I call it the Google or SEO mindset. We wrote the book. The book became a bestseller. We got a lot of um, backlinks and authority and all sorts of great people said great things about it. Um, but what we really, the, one of the main purposes of it was to try and figure out a way to take the model that I have here in Kansas City and find ways to, you know, educate, maybe even license that out to other people around the country. So what we mm -hmm. ended up doing is, which I think you'll find interesting or maybe some other folks will is we've got this site, SEO for Growth, right? But we built it on the WordPress multi-site network. So we've got multiple child sites that we've built that are city-specific. So we built one called St. Louis SEO for Growth. We built one called Atlanta SEO for Growth. And lo and behold, after we set these things up and, and launched them and put a bunch of great content that was specific for these cities, they started to rank. So St. Louis SEO, our St. Louis SEO for Growth, ranks number one in the maps and organically for that city. Atlanta SEO, we've got that one ranking in the top three. Las Vegas, we just launched, I think, last week. It's already on the first page, right? So we, what we've done is we've created this network of um, SEO websites for services in local cities so that other marketing folks could then license them and start to get SEO leads through something that had kind of a branded tr um, trust and proof behind it. So when you land on SC St. Louis SEO for Growth, you see based on a best-selling book, it's got reviews, it's got all the stuff, it's got the person on, all the things that we talked about in this um episode or on those little things. So that's kind of like the next thing is like a really tough to scale a business in Kansas City and take that and say, I'm going to open up another office and run another kind of, because that's tough. But I can take what I've learned and work with John on his piece of a package that into a book and then show other people how to do that by licensing mm. that model out. Now all of a sudden they rank for a service that they wouldn't normally go after and they're getting new leads through that channel. And they've also got now some ability to um, have some credibility. Because again, if you're selling SEO services, I think it's really important to show that there's something behind it and you're just not another like cold caller, or robo caller or yeah, something yeah. guaranteeing ranking. So you ask the next phase, that's really what's kind of it, is trying to figure out ways to, to kind of scale something out 
um, and maybe get a small piece of it versus trying to take a big chunk and say, I'm going to conquer the world by creating 50 more Kansas City web designs, you know, around hmm. around the U.S. or whatever. So that's been an interesting thing. We, we signed up. We showed people. We had a webinar. By the end of the webinar, we had 15 cities. I think we've got 17 cities launched right now. We've kind of closed the program now while we get those launched. But um, that's been an exciting thing. And, again, it was – it's this thing of let's just not create a book for the purpose of having a book. Let's have a book. Let's launch it. Let's create courses off of it. Let's see if there's ways to license it and help other people out. So again, we're figuring out ways to kind of have these multiple win-wins off of it and not mm. just thinking of the one launch or the one piece of it and then leaving it at that. Um, and that's, so that's the one that we're working on that. We've got the SEO for growth. We've got the SEO for growth kind of certification and we call it agency partner a model. And then I'm just, you know, continuing to kind of grow our SEO and, and, um, web design business here in Kansas City, which we love doing, um, which is really just kind of pretty much specific to Kansas City businesses, some regional ones. We've got a few in other states um, that are kind of finding us in other places, but um, this is kind of where my heart is, you know, small business, small local businesses. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that's ever, ever going to change. I'll be doing this in, as long as I, I can do it, basically. Hmm. That's, that's great. So I look forward to seeing more. I noticed that you we're doing the certifications on the SEO for growth website. So we're almost ready for that. <laughs> yeah. We got, so in All terms right. of contacting me at check SEO for growth, um, I love LinkedIn. That's my favorite thing. I always connect with anybody that of similar interest on that piece. And that's kind of where I spend most of my time socially. But if you want to check out what we kind of built, um, I've got kcwebdesigner.com, which is how we built our agency, you know, model and offering and it's cool because if you type up Kansas City Web Design you'll see we kind of rank pretty much for everything around here locally so it's not just me talking we actually do do rank and have a lot of clients <laughs> and I've got an SEO site that ranks number one if you type in Kansas City SEO or kcseopro.com hmm. um, if you wanted to look and make sure that uh, so sometimes you know when you talk to people it's yeah, funny yeah, to talk to people in a meeting yeah, if you're able to sit in a meeting and say type in Kansas City SEO we come up you know number one two and three it's all of a sudden the eye slide up. I was okay. Well, it's another. It's not like an eye roll type thing. It's like okay, these guys doing it and they're actually practicing what they're preaching. They're ranking. It gives you a lot more kind of credibility in what you're saying. So, so I you know challenge your the audience to, to prove to prove that I know what I'm saying. I'm just not yeah. another one of these SEO shills that's you know claiming to right. have the yeah. to have the right solution or right approach to Google. All right. Well, that's great. Thanks, Phil. Um, so we'll have the links to all of those places there, and certainly if you Google. SEO Kansas or something like that, um, you'll find Phil at the top of the Google rankings and you can reach out and thank him for all this wonderful information he's shared today. That's great. So what's the number one piece of advice you'd give to any business owner that wants to be a leader in innovation and productivity? The number one piece of advice, um, I to me, I'm always going to, um, I'm always going to come back and say, that you should have a web centric strategy for everything. So I always, I'm always, you know, I don't, I came into the business wanting to be able to figure out ways to dominate Google. And what I found was you can't just be a great race car driver. You need a car and the website's the car. Hmm. So whatever you're going to be doing in the future, I don't even care if it's like, I'm even telling people that we've interviewed for like positions here. It's like, you know, if you're not doing anything you want, you want some advice go out and build your own website and start building your authority now. Start blogging on stuff. Start, you know, start showing people. Build up a track record and, and record it on a website in a way that shows that you're a professional type thing. I think that extends to, to people and businesses as well. So take it back to your website. Make sure you've got a nice professional website. Make sure that it's, um, it's, um, it's built you know, SEO friendly and make sure that you're publishing and making that the source of your body of work. And that's really what websites should be right now is proof, you know, the, the stuff that you're doing so people can go and see. And that's kind of, that's where I, I, I tell people to come back all the time is, is, um, you know, the, it's the web now. So let's make your, let's make sure you've got a web centric approach and, and have the right web strategy. That's great advice. Yeah. I love that. I love the, the idea of, you know, even for people still beginning their careers and, kind of positioning themselves uh, rather than just randomly sending out resumes, so uh, build up that profile on your own website. Great advice. Exactly. Mm. All right. Well, finally then, Phil, I always ask my guests this, who would you like me to interview on a future Nova Buzz podcast and why? Um, well, who would I like you to interview? Um, great question. I mean, there's so many folks out there that I think are inspiring. 
Um, of course, as soon as you say that, I think John Jance, because I think he's been, he's just been such a personal um, mentor to me and it's really helped me kind of take me to the next level um, just from his, his approach. So he's always great, but I don't know, maybe you've had him on before. <laughs> it's kind of old Actually, news. we haven't, we haven't had John on before, but I have, I have been involved in the, the business system summit. I don't know whether John mentioned that um, the business system summit was an online summit um, where a whole bunch of people shared their processes and systems. And John was involved in that as well. So I was going to reach out to him based on that. But of course, if hmm. I can get an introduction from you, it would be even better. I, so keen to have that. That'd be great. On. Yeah. He'll definitely, I mean, he's all into that too. And I got another, I mean, just, you just, as soon as you mentioned that, I, I actually, yeah, I listened to some of them for some reason. I, I wasn't thinking of this question ahead of time. So I didn't have one off the top of my head. But, um, well, I thought there was one inspirational lady in the network. Her name is Nita Radatich. Um, she's like a 20 year Las Vegas, um, uh, news anchor. And she's kind of made the transition to, um, to being a marketing consultant. And it's just really interesting to hear somebody with that perspective on how they come into mark, you know, come into marketing and because it's totally different, you know, most other people have been doing it for years or they had like a corporate job or something like that. Hmm. Um, I think she's got a really interesting perspective on things. And, it's, you know, you, you talk to all these people, you read stuff and every every once in a while something like like sticks because it was interesting enough or different enough. And I think that she might be a good one um, all right. to have She, she if you're thinking about you know, some of that's kind of something along, more along my lines. Of course, there's all sorts of like, you know, major influencers that are out there that are great, but they might be a little bit harder to. Yeah, to, uh, yeah. Well, well, we book sometimes. But I saw you. Did you have Jeff? Did I see Jeff Bolas on yours, or was that? No, we haven't had Jeff on ours. We've had. Um, well, we had Kevin Kelly on last week. I think that was great. We published one last that. one. Yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah. we had uh, Michael Michael E. Gerber on back in November. I think that was the one so, I was thinking. That was yeah. the one I was thinking. I knew there was mm. some another one that I was scrolling through here. So yeah, so it's, it's sometimes hard to get these folks that are you know really busy and really in demand, but. They, they, you know, usually they're very generous with their time. Well, you know, and podcasting is just, it was like John will talk about, you guys are talking, I don't know how long you've done it, but I mean, it, it was important for a while and all of a sudden it's like the last couple, two, three years, I think it's like super hot again. Hmm. Um, and even for me, I, I went and I was like, it just totally blew my mind how awesome podcasting is. Cause it's like, if you think about how people go out and like, Okay, say for one tactic people use in SEO is to do a guest post and try and get that guest post placed on an authority website. Well, you got to you know, crunch out a thousand words. Um, it's got to be really good, probably better than stuff you put on your website. People are inundated with guest blog post type of things, and you got to pitch it and go out, and it takes a lot of time to write it up, or it may be expensive um, to do it. But you know, if you position yourself the right way and have something, it's so much easier to talk to somebody for 20 or 40 you know, minutes and give your best stuff and hopefully bring your A game than it is to spend an entire day or half a day trying to write something that's good enough to put on their website. And they'll yeah. probably reject it anyway because they're not <laughs> accepting guest blog posts, right? Yeah. So all of right. a sudden you do this blog post, it's the production, I mean, sorry, you do this podcast, the production value is a lot higher. You get access to an audience, right? You get access to however the way the host promotes it, maybe through email or social media, uh, show notes on the website type of thing. So there's all these like extra benefits from doing it. Plus it's just a cooler thing. You're a guest, right? Hmm. And you, and as a host, you know, host, you're the host. So it's like you get all these extra benefits, all this kind of stuff. So it really just blew my mind how like this, I think has become one of the ultimate content marketing things. And then we talked about how to differentiate yourself. Well, you are differentiating yourself as a host and a guest, right? So it's just like one of the ultimate pieces of content marketing. I just started doing this like a couple months ago. I think, in fact, I think, I think um, Kim Doyle, who you mentioned was the very first one I've done. I've probably done, you know, a couple, a dozen or maybe two since then, but yeah. um, completely, completely has blown my mind how powerful this is from a content marketing standpoint and how it is actually, I think the perfect form of organic link building because you put show notes, I earn the links back to the sites that you're going to note. I'm going to link back to your website we're doing it the way Google wants us to do, and we're creating great content. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Just, it's, um, just and it's natu- fabulous. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's totally natural. It's as you say, it's the way Google wants it done, and it's genuine, it's sincere, and and a lot of value in it as well. So exactly. Thanks for that. So John and Nina, uh, look out for an invitation from us to the Innova I'm Buzz going podcast. to do it. I promise. Yeah. Courtesy of uh, courtesy of Phil. 
And um, yeah, so thanks, Phil. It's, it's been great today. You've been very generous with your time and I've really enjoyed this and I've taken pages and pages of notes here. So thanks so much for sharing your time and insights with us so generously today. I really appreciate this. And the other thing about podcasts, when you talk to somebody like yourself, that's I'm so insightful and, and so grateful to be a part of it. But the other thing I would say about podcasting, especially when it's what's fun ones like this, is it really kind of gets you supercharged. I'm sure you're probably will feel a little bit blood's flowing, my blood's flowing. Hopefully people get you know motivated that are listening to it. And it's just kind of one of the nice little um, additional benefits that I think podcasting has. So again, thank you so much for having me on the show. So I'm yeah. always kind of leaving it like really excited and pumped up. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I always feel the same as well. I, I think, you know, I say to myself each time when I hang up, I, I've just had an hour's masterclass, you know, with somebody that really knows their stuff and is really on top of their game. And you think, you know, I mentioned um, Kevin Kelly or Michael E. Gerber earlier. You think, gee, you know, what would you, have to pay to have an hour's one-on-one masterclass with people like that. And here I am in my podcast talking to them. Well, that's the, isn't the access has just blown my absolute yeah. mind. So you go yeah. ask somebody and try and contact them, but as soon as you ask them to be a host on your guest, all of a sudden chances are much higher that you can get access to an influencer who seems almost untouchable. So that's it's right. just really yeah. totally, totally blown my mind. And it's one of these things, like I was mentioning in the book, the book, a book project to me seems so far away podcasting did too but all of a sudden i see how this works i'm just like geez it's really great but and i also see why the influencers do it look they get to reach an audience they get all this kind of stuff they don't have to spend a lot of time or prepare for it because a lot of them already have great experience and they know they're going to throw some nuggets out there so it's super works their time right because they can Hmm. reach a lot of different audiences pretty quickly without having to put a lot of time invested into it so great great stuff just love that's right yeah all right. Thanks again, Phil. I wish you all the best for the future for SEO for growth and all the initiatives you're doing there and also for your Kansas City web design and SEO um, agency. So let's keep in touch. Yes. Yes, let's please do. Thank you so much. Thanks again for having me on the show. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Phil as much as I enjoyed this interview. There are just so many exceptionally valuable insights and recommendations here that Phil shared with us. And I encourage you to visit the show notes and follow the advice that Phil shared for your own business. All of those ideas and tips that Phil shared with us can be found at anovabiz.com.au forward slash SEO for growth. That is S-E-O-F-O-R-G-R-O-W-T-H. All lowercase, all one word, anovabiz.com.au SEO for growth. You'll also find contact information there for getting in touch with Phil. We'd love to hear about your biggest takeaway from this episode and the action you'll take as a result in the comments section below the blog post. Phil suggested that I interview John Jantz of Duct Take Marketing and also Nina Radetich on a future Innovabuzz podcast. So John and Nina... Keep your eye on your inboxes for an invitation from us to the InnovaBuzz podcast, courtesy of Phil Singleton. If you haven't already done so, head on over to iTunes or Stitcher and subscribe to the InnovaBuzz podcast so you'll never miss a future episode. If you haven't left us a review yet, why not? Seriously though, we always welcome feedback and reviews. Let us know how we're doing. If there's anything you'd like us to cover or questions you want answered on a future InnovaBuzz podcast or guests you'd like us to interview, please send those ideas to us. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember, be awesome and keep innovating. <music>